just say welcome to, to you again. Just thank you so much for taking the opportunity to join in with us. Uh, just to really just celebrate God's goodness and to inspire one another, to encourage each other. Just as we're desiring to, to love God, to pursue after Him uh, with everything inside of us. And so uh, if you have your Bible with you today, if you'll just open them up with me once again to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to pick up in verse 9. Uh, here in just a, a few moments, but as you're turning there, uh, let me just remind you of a couple things uh, today. Uh, number one, if you ever have any prayer requests or anything that we can help you with, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to the church, call the church office, email the church, and just let us uh, know how we could be a, of help, of service to you. Uh, we consider it a, a great joy, just the opportunity to serve you, to stand uh, alongside with you, and and most of all, just to pray for you, uh, just believe in God's goodness, God's deliverance, God's healing, God's help into each one of your lives. And I, I also just want to say uh, thank you so much uh, for your giving uh, unto the Lord. As always, uh, you can mail in your giving. You can give online, uh, whichever way is easiest for you. And as always, if you need help with that, just contact the church office uh, and we'll do the best that we can uh, to help you. But once again, we just want to say thank you so much uh, for your faithfulness uh, and giving unto the Lord. And, and what a, a, an exciting uh, week we had last week, just the opportunity to, uh, to burn the note, to realize that we're now uh, debt-free here at Cornerstone Church. But as we uh, announced a little bit last week, we have a, a, a new building uh, plan that we'll be announcing in the upcoming year, outlining in the upcoming year. But we have renewed our, our building uh, fund here at Cornerstone Church. So if you ever feel so in press to, to give an advance toward the, the new projects here at the church, uh, please just take the liberty to do so. As always, just mark it on your giving building fund so that we know where to direct that giving toward. And we just say thank you in advance uh, once again for your faithfulness unto the Lord. And then lastly, before I jump into today's message, I just want to remind you once again uh, that we have these new connect groups that will be beginning here at, at Cornerstone. Church, Just a beautiful opportunity just to join together uh, with others within the church or maybe some neighbors that you would like to invite to, to join in. And, and we would uh, appreciate your help with that and just simply uh, contacting the church office, just letting us know that you would like to be a part of one of these connect groups or just stopping by the foyer. There's a sign up sheet out in the foyer and you can just stop by there, uh, sign up and leave your phone number. And we would love to just reach out to you uh, here in the next few days and, and just work to connect you in one of the connect groups uh, that will be kicking out, kicking up once again here uh, the, the second weekend of September. But let, let's jump into the series that we've been on now. This is our fourth week that we've entitled Standing Firm Under Stress. And I've entitled today's message, The Salvation of Souls. Uh, once again, the salvation of souls. And here in just a moment, I'm going to read a little bit of scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, picking up in the ninth verse. But I want you to realize uh, right here at the beginning of this, that salvation is the most important consideration for, for you as well as for me. That I, I simply believe that salvation is the most important consideration for every person. The very thoughts... That our faith will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed fills us with an inexpressible and a glorious joy, according to 1 Peter verses 7 through 8. The goal of our faith, once again, the goal of our faith is its wonderful consummation will be the ultimate salvation of our souls when we're resurrected with the opportunity to live with Jesus throughout all eternity. I want you to realize today that that salvation is not only important to me and important to you, but I believe that salvation is important to God. The salvation of us, our souls was planned in God's heart before the foundation of the world. He determined that humans would be created in his spiritual image and eternal souls 
who would have freedom of choice, that, that we're created in his image, and by being created in the image of God, we have the freedom of choice, the freedom to, to choose God, or we would say the freedom not to choose God. He elected to provide us a Savior, Jesus Christ, who would live, die, and then would rise again on the third day. And I believe that Jesus is our adequate Savior. God also elected that everyone who trusts in Jesus as the Son of God, excuse me, as the Son of God, would be sanctified by the Holy Spirit, redeemed by the blood of Christ, and kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is what we talked about in the second teaching uh, in this series, being kept by the power of God. And I just pray once again that as we jump into this today, the, this salvation of our souls, that our heart realizes that there's a yearning with inside of each one of us is that opportunity to walk in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I realize, maybe you realize, that living without salvation that is provided by Jesus Christ often, if not always, results in stress within our lives. And we're talking about today, once again, standing firm under stress. And when we choose not to live with Jesus, when we choose not to walk in that salvation that Jesus provides for us, that creates even a greater extent of stress into each one of our lives. And so if we can just choose Jesus, if, if we can choose salvation with Jesus, then it helps to bring peace and comfort as we're desiring to stand firm under the stress of life that we often face. But I would say once again that we add to that stress as individuals if we don't choose Jesus, if we don't choose Him and to receive His salvation into each one of our lives. So let's jump into the scripture this morning. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Pick up with me now in the ninth verse. It reads, For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of of your souls concerning this salvation the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you search intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of christ and the glories that would follow and let's conclude in verse 12 it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven even angels long to look into these things would you join me in a moment of prayer father i just say thank you once again for this opportunity that we have together god just to spend uh, just a little bit more time reflecting in your in your truth god growing in your revelation god and we just trust in your divine work into each one of our lives god understanding the importance of salvation the salvation of our souls god the the, the need to reach out to others that others might be able to experience salvation through jesus christ God, and we just once again trust that your will would be accomplished in us and through us in these next few moments that we have together today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I just want to present to you three things that we find uh, through God's word today in the regards to uh, salvation. No, number one, the salvation of souls was the subject of Old Testament searching and also revelation number one the the salvation of souls was the subject of old testament searching and revelation look look back with me to first peter chap, uh, chapter 1 verse 10 it reads concerning this salvation the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently 
and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstance to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Let continue just a little bit longer. It was revealed to them that, that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. The Old Testament prophet, prophets prophesied under the influence of of the Holy Spirit. I, I want you to realize that, that the working of the Holy Spirit isn't just found in the New Testament, but the Holy Spirit was there working and influencing lives, inspiring lives, uh, such as the prophets there in the Old Testament. So I, with that in mind, I just want to look at two things today. Number one, the content of the revelation of their prophecy. What, In essence, what, what, what did they try to reveal through the prophetic word. And I think we find just three simple things, and here they are, that the Christ would suffer, that the Christ would be glorified, and that people, the Israelites, as well as the Gentiles, would be saved. These three things, one more time, that the Christ would suffer, that the Christ would be glorified, and that people would be saved. And so we, we, we wonder, where in the world did Peter get this message? Where did Peter get this sermon? I, I believe it comes from that time, one of those moments that, that he was present there in the upper room with Jesus. I, I would lure it down to after the resurrection of Jesus there in the upper room, uh, probably from this passage, Luke 24, picking up in the 44th verse, he said unto them, and this is the words of Jesus, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled as that is written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. He continues, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in this city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And so we wonder, what, what are the passages that Jesus must have been referring to when he, he made this statement there to the disciples with others that were joined there in the upper room? Well, let's look into this from the three things that we recognize that the prophets made mention of over and over and that Jesus alludes to right here in this statement. Number one, that the Christ would suffer. I believe that he probably was making reference to Psalms 22, but maybe even here, Isaiah, Isaiah 52, and leading all the way into Isaiah 53. Let, let me just read some of this for you. Isaiah 52, picking up in the 13th verse. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, uh, chapter 53, picking up now in the second verse. He grew up before him like a tender shoot or like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. It continues to say he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with sufferings. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and they esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed 
for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all he was oppressed it says in verse 7 and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before his shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth by oppression and judgment he was taken away and who can speak of his descendants for he was cut off from the land of the, li- uh, of the living, for the ter- transgressions of my people was he stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And let me conclude this in the 11th verse. And the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. What do we find here but simply a prophetic word referencing the, 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 the suffering Messiah, the, the suffering that the Christ would experience. Uh, how about the prophetic word re- referring to the, the glorification of Christ or, or that Christ himself would be glorified? I, I believe we can find one of these prophetic words in Psalms 110, but we find another one of these in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Let me, let me read it for us today. It says, For to us... A child is born to us, a son is given, and and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever and it concludes the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this so here we find some prophetic messages some prophetic words through the inspiration of the holy spirit of the christ who would suffer here of of the christ who would be glorified and the third part of that message is that that people would be saved the israelites the gentiles would be saved we find revelation of this through prophetic word there in Genesis chapter 12. We also find it in Psalms 47, Psalm 67. I, I want you to know today, I, I'm not giving you all of the scriptures where we find these prophetic messages, but just some of the scriptures where we find this prophetic messages, just presenting to you the content of the revelation of the prophetic messages. And now I want you to capture the nature of the revelation. The nature of the revelation. Go, go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Once again, the 10th verse. It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care. Here we find the nature, the nature of the revelation. Number one is this, that, that the prophets searched diligently. They searched diligently, wanting to receive the word of God, to share the word of God. Number two, they were probably aware that while speaking to their own generation, they were also speaking for later generations. And that while speaking to their own people, they were also speaking to the Gentiles to come who would later receive Christ as the savior of their life. Let me continue with this on the nature of the revelation. Number three, the details as to the times and the exact condition of the times were not revealed to them according to verse 11 here in 1 Peter chapter one. The Old Testament prophets did not seem to distinguish between the first and the second advents of the Messiah with the gospel age. In between, and the last thing that I want you to capture, capture number four, is they must have had in mind a near fulfillment, 
of that prophetic word, which in many instances is really now not clear to us. God had in mind, we would say, a larger meaning than just the basic prophetic message. Let me give this to you for example. Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 through 17, must, must have had an immediate reference to Ahaz. God had in mind a fulfillment with reference to Jesus that probably was not in Isaiah's mind. Let, let me give this to you found in Matthew chapter 1 verse 22 that we also find in Isaiah 7 14. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. So I lay all of this before you within the first point. Let me give it to you one more time. The first point, the salvation of souls was the subject of Old Testament searching and revelation. And we talked about the, the prophetic message, the major prophetic message of the prophets that Jesus reiterates there in the, the end of the Gospel of Luke, that the Christ would suffer, that Christ would be glorified, and by that, that many would be saved, the Israelites and also the Gentiles. And so if I was to summarize this whole first point, the point is not that events fulfilled what the prophet said, but that events fulfilled what God had said through the prophets. This was the fulfillment, not just of the prophet's words, but this was the fulfillment of what God was speaking, of what God was wanting to do, how God desires to save souls, how, how God desires to save your soul just as well as God desires to save my soul. And we find this over and over again through the prophetic messages that we find all throughout the Old Testament it leads me to point to the salvation of souls is the subjects of the New Testament preaching. One more time, the salvation of souls is the subject of New Testament preaching. Look back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Pick up with me now in the 12th verse. It reads, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Number two, one more time, the salvation of souls is the subject of New Testament preaching. I, I just want to give you four thoughts with this briefly. God uses certain people to preach the gospel just as in times past he used he used certain people to prophesy think of this for just a moment in the old testament he used people such as isaiah jeremiah ezekiel daniel the list can go on and on to bring forth the prophetic message simply that christ would suffer that that christ would be glorified and that people would be saved but when we look into the new testament here through the inspiration of the holy spirit god god spoke through peter god spoke through john god, god spoke through paul god spoke through Timothy and the list could go on even today how God is still speaking through people to get the message of Christ out there why so that people would be saved that so that people can walk into a right relationship with Jesus himself secondly the Holy Spirit assist preachers in the New Testament as well as today as they proclaim the message just as he assisted the prophets. The Holy Spirit is yet still today working into the lives of people, inspiring people with the word that they could pass and share, a word of encouragement, a word of inspiration, a word of help, a word of change, what, whatever is necessary that God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is assisting us, working through us to deliver, once again, the message of God. Thirdly, for you, the message of the prophets and the message of the preachers 
is the same, which is, as I've given many times, the suffering and the glory of Christ, the suffering and the glory of Christ, which leads to the redemption of souls, the salvation of souls, leads me to number four, the purpose of both prophecy and preaching is the salvation of souls. The reason I stand up here every day is because I believe still yet that God desires to save souls. We see it on a weekly basis of, of God restoring lives, of, of God redeeming lives, of God saving lives, of God healing people. That, that's why I, I believe many others, stand up every week, every day of our lives and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. The, the, the same reason the prophets gave forth the word of prophecy was why the salvation of souls. I believe once again that God desires that none would perish, but that all would be saved. God saved thousands of years ago, but I want you to know that I, I still believe that God is saving today. I believe that this could be one of the greatest stress reliefs of our lives is salvation, receiving Jesus into our lives, for He's the one that enables us to stand firm under the stresses that we face of life. This leads me to my third and final point for us today. The salvation of souls is the subject of angelic inquiry. The subject of angelic inquiry. Look back to verse 12 one more time at the very end of this. It says, even angels long to look into these things. According to Peter here, angels are interested in God's plan. Uh, think of this. Note, note Paul's affirmation of the angelic interest. He makes this statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. We, we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. And he adds to this a little bit later in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that, that God was manifest in the flesh, flesh, justified in the spirit. And he says, and seen of angels. And Jesus makes this declaration in Luke chapter 15, verse 10. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, rep who repents. Hear me out. I want you to realize that when, when somebody turns to Jesus, there's rejoicing even in the heavenly realm amongst the angels. Why? Because the salvation of souls is the subject of angelic inquiry. So once again, let me give these to you briefly as just a, a, a concluding thought. The salvation of souls was the subject of Old Testament searching and revelation. Number two for you today, the salvation of souls is the subject of the New Testament preaching. And lastly, as I just declared, the salvation of souls is the subject of angelic inquiry. As I begin to conclude today's message, I want you to realize once again, just as I begin this, that the salvation of souls is the most important thing in this world. I don't believe there's anything more important than somebody surrendering their lives to Jesus and receiving the salvation of their souls. It is the object of God's revelation, of the Holy Spirit's work, and also of the Lord's coming. It is the only reason I believe for our pilgrimage here on earth, that is to experience the saving of our souls and then to help others to discover this exact same salvation that they themselves could experience, that they themselves could then walk into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. As the scripture declares, how shall we escape if we neglect so great of a salvation? In essence, there is no escape for us except through salvation. Salvation is the only thing that can save us 
from a, uh, that eternal destructive experience and enable us to walk into that, that eternal beautiful experience with Jesus throughout all eternity. So once again, as I conclude, I, I just simply encourage you as the prophetic, as the prophetic word would declare, as the prophets would over and over, as the New Testament preachers would over and over, and as people still do today, proclaiming that, that Jesus has come to save souls. It's our choice, the freedom of our choice as we're recognized, created within the image of God. That choice to choose God. I believe that there's a a longing, a, a stirring within our hearts for that, that beautiful relationship with God. The reality is that many haven't figured this out, haven't discovered it. But you now know it's, a, it's available for you today. I believe it's the greatest experience of peace, yet also the greatest experience of comfort into our life is to know that we can walk rightfully with God. So what's your choice today? What's your choosing today? Once again, we're talking about standing firm under stress, but I believe this is one of the greatest stress releases of our life is to know that I'm standing right with God. I encourage you, choose God today. Accept Him as the savior of your life. The Bible says that if I, if I would believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of the mistakes we've ever made. Could you make that decision today? Let me pray with you. Father, I just say thank you for the opportunity that we've been able to have in a moment just like this, just spending some reflection in, in your word. We realize that, that this was the message of the prophets. That this was the message of the New Testament preachers. It's the message of, of, of people today, the proclamation of salvation through Jesus. Father, I pray that my friends would make that choice today. That, that choice to, to choose Jesus, that, that choice to accept Jesus, the Messiah. The one who would suffer for us. The one who would be glorified so that many, many could experience salvation. I pray that we would choose salvation today by believing in Jesus. By confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And accepting your forgiveness. Lord, trusting that your will is being accomplished in and through each one of us. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining in with us today. I trust in God's goodness over your life throughout the remainder of the week. Be blessed today.